Hello and welcome to SD Europe's podcast. My name is Luke Cox. I lead SD Europe's communications. Many people listening will know Football Supporters Europe. FSE represents football fans in Europe in 48 different countries. SD Europe and FSE have been working together and alongside each other for over a decade now. FSE acting upon issues such as ticketing, fan culture, discrimination and policing in football and SD Europe aiming to increase support and involvement in the running of football clubs and football institutions. Today, Ronan Evian, FSD's Executive Director, will talk to us about the challenges the organisation has faced over the past eight months and what FSE believes needs to happen post-COVID. Ronan, thank you ever so much for accepting our invitation. Thanks, Luke. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to, to be with uh, you today after listening to, to the previous podcast. So thanks for having us. Great. Um, so to kick things off, um, could you give a, a brief introduction of yourself and about your organization, FSE? Sure. Um, about myself, uh, I'm based in Brittany in France. I come from a uh, from ultra background at my club, FC Nantes. I've also been involved in, uh, in community trust initiatives um, at club level and national level. I'm involved in France in the INS, the Association Nationale des Supporters, which is the national representative body. And um, I work for Football Supporters Europe since 2015. <clears throat> I've first be, been the coordinator of the project uh, Respect Fan Culture around the Euro 2016 in France, which was coordinating um, the deployment of uh, fans embassies and I'm um, the um, executive director of Football Supporters Europe since late 2016. So as you said, we, we work on a broad range of issues, ticketing, away fans rights, discrimination, policing in football. Uh, and we work together with SD Europe and also CAFE, uh, so that the three of us, we represent the, the, the broad range of, uh, of fan culture that we have in, in Europe. We're based in Hamburg in Germany, uh, so obviously having staff in, in different countries. And at the time of the pandemic, uh, we are all on, uh, on uh, working from home at the moment, so we are we're scattered uh, throughout three different countries. And um, yeah, that's who we are. Great, fantastic introduction. Um, so many listening uh, will have heard about your OUT project. Um, could you tell us briefly about the project and the upcoming closing event? Yeah, the, the reason why we started this project against uh, um, fights against homophobia and any form of uh, discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity, the reason why we started this project was that on one hand, we had a gro growing number of LGBT fan groups in our membership, but also individual members. Um, LGBT fan groups either active at the club level or at the national level, uh, some now like the, the Three Lions Pride or even following the national team, the English national team. So we thought we needed to offer them a platform to exchange ideas, views, experiences, good practices, and to influence the, the, the work of our organi the, the, the work of our organization so that we can become more inclusive and 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 more um, familiar with LGBT rights and all the issues surrounding it. And then also we've been involved in projects in the past that were very much in a niche, meaning that um, it was it was fans discussing the issues with each other. And we thought that to, to, to seek systemic change and to, 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 to look for, to have a real influence in the world of football, we needed to, to, to work with other stakeholders and to build bridges between the various progressive stakeholders in the game in, in European football. So that's why we had three types of, we have three types of partners in the project. Um, an LGBT fan group, which is uh, Pride in Football, the national coordination uh, of LGBT fan groups in England and Wales. We have an ally organization, Football Fans Against Homophobia in Germany. I won't say that in German, I won't try that. And uh, the Belgian, the Royal Belgium F uh, Football Association, which is one of the, the European football association that's been at the forefront of LGBT inclusion during the last few years. And then working with working with FIFPRO, working with UFA, working with a number of clubs, leagues, clubs, foundations, and uh, looking how all this 
people can work together and then try to influence uh, how they how the football in general um, integrates and, and offer safe space for uh, for LGBT uh, people from 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 the, the the boardroom to the stands on the pitch anyone working in football really so the project is coming to an end we are uh, launching it uh, on the 11th of December at uh, an online event at the European Parliament together with the LGBT2 group and the sports group of the European Parliament. And uh, we're publishing a handbook, which is a collection of, of, of good practices and recommendations that can be replicated elsewhere in, uh, in European football. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, many listening will agree that in a year when when uh, you know, the question and the issue of equality um, and diversity has been so prominent, I think this is such an important project. And uh, as I say, many people listening will agree that it's uh, that it's uh, fantastic that FSE have been carrying this out. Um, and the, if I may add, um, football has been a bit late addressing the issue of LGBT inclusion and LGBT rights and the fight against all form of discrimination associated to it. Uh, we still see international tournaments in the UFR region, but also elsewhere in the world being um, handed over to countries that have a very poor background in terms of LGBT rights. So we also hope to, 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 to raise awareness and that uh, in the future, um, both UFR and FIFA uphold to their own uh, anti-discrimination standards and, and, and question the whether it is uh, it is the right thing to do to 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 hand over a competition to a country where where LGBT fans, players, anyone working in football won't feel safe when they will be traveling. Absolutely, yeah, I think that's a really important point that you mentioned there. Um, it does build into something much bigger, and you know, looking for the future outlook of football, doesn't it? Great. So moving on to uh, the next question, Renan. Um, so. As activist groups, uh, the pandemic has hit SD Europe and FSE in different ways. How would you describe the past eight months for your organisation? Well, the, 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 I think the, the, the same as pretty much anyone else in uh, in the world. We had to adapt. And now we are in a relatively safe place because uh, our funding hasn't been impacted. Then the biggest challenge for us was the postponing of the Euro 2020. It's been postponed one year and we still don't know exactly how it's going to take place. And we had we have a project together with UFA called Respect Fan Culture. So for my colleagues working on that project, we had to adapt. Uh, we had for some of them reduced the working hours and, and, and so on. And then, yeah, it became a whole different job. There's no more, uh, we, we don't accompany or, or monitor uh, the European away games anymore. Um, and, and that was a big part of our work during the season, but we do, yeah, we work, we work differently. We do, we do, we do other things. We've been together with SD Europe, um, monitoring the, and, and, and communicating or sharing the, the solidarity actions done by fan groups during, especially during the first wave, during the first lockdown. And yeah, I, again, we can't complain. None of us, is, we haven't lost our job. Our organization still exists. So that's compared to other people in Europe, we're in a, we're in a good place. And, um, and yeah, we question the way we work. Uh, I'm, I'm sure we've been reinventing the way we work. We have a lot more Zoom calls, a lot less travels. And I think this will have a lasting uh, impact on the, um, on the way we do our job. And it's also a good occasion to, to, to try new projects, to reach out to new people and to, yeah, again, to, to reinvent the way we, we work and we see football. Mm. So as you say, say that, you know, you have to sort of reinvent the way that you work. Um, what has the shift in priorities been for you this year? Um, and what would you say has been top of your list? You know, is it the return to play perhaps? Yeah, certainly. Again, the monitoring uh, European games was, was the core of our work during the season. And, and, and we don't have this, uh, we don't, we're not doing this anymore. So return to play, yes, it's... We've been training ourselves uh, through virus uh, experts, whether it is the WHO or other partners in the in the world of uh, let's say sports and human rights. Um, we've learned from from partners, from trade unions and other and other experts as well on how how we can respond and how we can get ready for the return uh, return to play. Um, our 
let's say, biggest experience at the moment has been the the Super Cup in Budapest, uh, between, the game between Bayern Munich and, and, and FC Sevilla, and which was like the, the real life experience, so to say. And we, we we published a report on that basis with some some recommendations. Now, a return to play with 25-30% in attendance seems entirely possible. But what we need to keep in mind also is that there shouldn't be any sort of pressure for fans to return because this is, in the end, um, and I heard a few a few weeks ago, someone from the SGSA said it was, it was all about a personal risk assessment. And that, that's what it is. We all, based on how we feel about the risk, how we feel, how we so physically, um, that's a personal decision whether we want to go back to the stadium or not, whether we think we can um, respect the social distancing rules. And as we see in France, but it's, I'm sure it will be the case in many other European countries, uh, some fan groups don't feel like returning to the stadium yet because, because um, they can't commit to respecting social distancing because, because that's the way, the way we are used to to interact with the game and to enjoy the game and so on. It's not possible at the moment. So some will simply decide not to go back. So I think our role as fan organization is to help uh, match organizers to, 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 to implement realistic uh, return to stadium protocol that match the way we experience the game and what we think is possible and what we think is not. And then in the end, it's an individual choice whether people feel safe and ready to, to, go, to go back to the stadium. Yeah, I think you, know, you make a good point there. Um, you know, many, many groups across Europe will be looking at you know, how fans are slowly returning to, to stadiums now. And it's still, you know, it's great to be able to go back and watch football, but it's still worlds away from what they're used to and what they enjoy. Um, so it's a really important area of work, isn't it? Yeah, the, and it's the same as, 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 as what we do usually. We just, we're just moving our usual methodology. You, you know, we, both of our organisations believe that, believe in dialogue and, and that if, if you want to implement to implement anything that has to do with fans, you need to ask them how they feel about it. If they agree, if they feel it's realistic, if they feel that they can, they can, they can, they can do it. And um, unfortunately, in a certain number of countries, uh, this is still not the case, despite of the recommendations from the um, the European institution, despite of the recommendation by the WHO. We still we see even in the majority of European countries, return to stadia protocols being discussed and put in place without asking for the input of the very people that would be in charge of the actual implementation. And this is not a realistic scenario. You can't do it without the fans because, because if, they, if you don't get them on board, then who is going to implement your, your, um, your protocols? And I'm afraid that in a certain number of European countries, um, the, the, only, the only response that would, be, that would be offered would be a repressive one, which is stewards, police, whoever will be there, forcing people to respect the protocol. And that's, that's not realistic. People need to, 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 need to buy it, need to feel to own it. And that's how you can then have a crowd of 10, 20,000 people um implementing your protocols Mm. and you know i think this sort of quite neatly uh leads into the next question um you know uh, never has the truth of the saying football without fans uh is nothing be more apparent you know i think we've seen in champions league games you know after matches players pointing this out um how can we ensure that fans are a fully are a fully part of the discussion surrounding the future of football when the pandemic is over. I think it, it, it's true that, that football without fans is nothing. It's never been more apparent. And and before the return of the game, we heard pundits, commentators saying that yeah, it's not such a big deal that fans are not there. But in the end, uh, TV ratings and, and and comments from players and from anyone that actually watched the game shows that yes, this is not this is not the same uh, show spectacle and it is usually uh, and all the attempts to replace fans by you know cartoon figures, augmented reality or whatever, nothing nothing is working. I think the most probably the most pathetic attempt is in is in Spain where you see those you know it looks like. Um, the eSport game FIFA 1996 
it doesn't even look good <laughs> and uh and it is definitely not improving the experience of of the fans uh, on the other hand there's there's a real risk for lost generation mm, because less and less people are watching tv um obviously because of the economic situation um a lot of fans don't have the money to pay for pay-per-view in england or even just a regular tv subscription like here uh in France, and we see that the TV ratings are not, are not are really, really, really low. So um, there is a risk for lost generation. There's a risk to lose a lot of the of the of the active fans that would, that would potentially lose the connection to the game. And there, there, there was always a financial sailing of how much money people can put into football because of the away travels, the season tickets, the TV subscriptions, and so on. And obviously, the sailing is going going lower and lower. And football need to need to stop believing in this fantasy of a forever growth there's a limit and uh if if um if football wants to limit the impact of the of the pandemic on on on, on, on its economy they need to bring the fans back on board and they need to they need to they need to work closer with them we've asked fans um clubs leagues uh fa's have asked fans for sacrifices some have given away you know the rem- what was remaining of their season ticket to help clubs uh, bridging the gap at the time when the games the game was stopped and uh, there needs to be a counterpart for this sacrifice and so far we haven't seen it so we've asked for, we've heard this narrative um, that we're all on the same boat and we're all working together to save football and today there's an article from the New York Times showing that uh, FIFA executive committee members haven't even slightly reduced their, their, their salary, the compensation they receive. So we're not all in the same boat. Fans have made sacrifices. Their personal life has been impacted. And giving away 100, 200, 300 euros on a season ticket, there's a lot of money for a lot of fans. So there needs to be an enlargement of the role we play in this pandemic. And there needs to be an enlargement that football can continue to antagonize its most faithful borrows to antagonize the communities and uh yeah the first thing to do now is to include fans representative in discussion on the future of football and how football avoids uh, to be put in the same financial situation in five years time and i think a lot of fans have realized now how fucked up football economy is and how much uh big clubs are for most of them are pretty badly run companies, small companies, unsustainable with no reserves whatsoever. And I think this will have a lasting impact as well on, on let's say on the regular fan base, not, not the activists, but the people that are just going to games and following football from a safe distance, as so, so to say, then they will realize that even if your club is buying and selling players for millions in the end, there's nothing left at the end of the season. And, and that's, and, and that, that when you realize that, you realize how precarious the situation of your club is. So, yeah, we can only hope for now and, and position ourselves to be ready to contribute to this conversation. But this is, this, that's, that would be the fair choice from the football governing bodies to, to do things differently in the future. I think you mentioned some really poignant points there, you know, around... Um, this generation that could miss out. Um, I think you know, there's, there's got to be some real work there. And I think that, that football can't be naive about that. There is genuinely some work that needs to be done to nurture, you know, the active fan culture, because that there is a danger of this sort of stop gap could, could have a damaging effect on that. And I think as well, you know, there's been the instance with FIFA that you mentioned about payments, I think in Spain as well, I believe was it the, one of the executives at La Liga, you know, there's been a lot of discontent from Spanish supporters there. And, and again, you know, as you mentioned around, you know, clubs being able to spend millions on players and then at the end of the season, somehow having nothing left, it's, uh, it, it's, a, it's actually a culture that, you know, it, it's grown throughout football from the top to the bottom. And, you know, a lot of this really needs addressing. Um, and I, th- so, I think a lot of, I think a lot of us have, we sort of reconsidered our priorities. Now, in France, we are in a much better situation than in England, for example, because our club can't really disappear. Worst case scenario, you lose the professional status and you start again five, four, six, in the FIFA sixth division. Um, it would be a terrible scenario for people working for your club. But in the end, 
it's not going to go away. It's not going to get bankrupt, disappear or, or whatever. So when I said there's a shift in priorities, then once people realize that they can live without um, professional football, then uh, the question of, of the values and what the club stand for and what, what you actually want from it and what you expect from it and what, what it brings to the communities, uh, it changed completely the discussion, the narrative. And I think the expectations will be different in the future. And, um, and I speak for myself and my club, uh, if not, um, I think I would be happier with the club run differently uh, and, and, and not playing in elite football than, than continuing with this nonsense and sustainable um, the, the management that it has at the moment. So yeah, definitely a change in priorities. So how, how do you see the next three years uh, or so going in terms of supporter issues? Um, obviously you've mentioned a lot of things there, um, but is there anything specific that you see being a real challenge? Um, I think, and as I mentioned, we work with national team fans and there's a lot of uncertainty on, on where, where things are going. Uh, in terms of the Euro 2020 and 2021, the Men's World Cup in Qatar, the Women's World Cup in Australia and New Zealand. And I think for national team fans, it's, it's, it's a difficult moment, especially as it's a different community than club fans. You know, it's people that usually only come together at the time of the game. Well, the people who support the same club as you, you live in the same city. There are other forms of socialization. So I think it's, it's a difficult time for for national team fans and and I think there's a lot of, of concern of, of when, when, when things can return to normal and they can reconnect with the community that exists around around the national team. For the rest of us and for for, 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 for club fans, we'll just, the biggest the biggest question at the moment, what can what will have the biggest influence on on the future of the game, or at least the way we live it, is the upcoming reform of the UFA competition, which could have, depending on wh- which way things go, could have an influence on 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 everyone from from elite football to non-league because that could that could be a, the world uh, that could be we could have all different uh, calendars and and a completely different seasons and and so on. The difficulty at the moment, and it's been the same thing for a year and a half, is that we can only work with rumors and 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 uh, and uh, and whatever a few clubs are willing to drop to, to to the media so there hasn't been a transparent process and there hasn't been a process with a, with a, with a clear involvement of fans so um, obviously that's what we expect things are definitely going to speed up in the coming weeks and at the beginning of of 2021 so obviously that's something we are going to to watch very closely and then the return to normal in the next year, in the next season, two seasons, three season. Once the rest of the society returns to normal, I think the priority topic for fan organization will be that we're not treated differently. So at the time of the first wave, the first lockdown, and even now, the vast majority of fan groups have accepted the situation, have had a mature approach to the lockdown, have played an active role in the solidarity and so on because the rest of the society was at the same place, but the rights that we are putting on hold at the moment, the rights of movement, the rights, the, the freedom of movement, the right to go to a football game and so on, it's just on pause. And whenever the, so the rest of the society uh, is, is, is back on track, is back to normal, we can only expect that we're, we're treated the same way. Yeah? And that the pandemic is not used as an excuse to reduce uh, our rights. So in a certain number of European countries, there are discussions at the moment on whether the limitation of uh, freedom of movement, freedom of assembly, even freedom of expression uh, that has been imposed due to the pandemic and that is fair legitimate in most cases, whether, whether, whether there are limitations to it and when, when we return to normal. So I think we have to watch this space because some countries with... with uh, with a track record of, um, of not really treating uh, uh, football fans as, um, as humans, uh, will have, will, there will be a strong uh, temptation to actually use the pandemic to reduce again our rights. So uh, again, it's only, only assumptions, hypothesis, but uh, this is a, a space that we're going to watch closely in the coming months and years, I suppose. 
Well, Renan, that was fantastic. That's about all we have time for uh, today. Uh, so to, to finish this off, um, would, is there anything that you would like to say to the people and the supporters listening, um, you know, just about FSC's work going forwards or, you know, whatever you would like, really? No, I think that I think uh, we've discussed only only really worrying topics, but also there are some positive things going on. The the pandemic has reinforced the solidarity between between fans and fan groups. I've reinforced the communities, and I think uh, I think we need to 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 give credit to. To, to those communities, to those fans for that. And that um, the experience that a lot of fan groups have had during the pandemic will, uh, will also have, um, have a legacy. And I think, I think we are going to, to play a more important roles in our respective communities in the future. Well, that was great. Thanks ever so much, Renan. Uh, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Likewise, thanks Luke. Thanks so much for listening to this podcast. Please do listen to the other podcasts in this mini-series in addition to the ones that we've previously published. To find out more information about SD Europe, head to www.sdeurope.eu.